Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. The issue of inequality um, has been jumping up the political agenda in just the last 18 months. I mean, it barely registered as an issue, I think, even, even a couple of, couple of years ago. But uh, now it's virtually impossible to hear a major speech by a world leader in which uh, the challenge of in inequality doesn't become a central element of it. And the fact that it's taken so long, really, for inequality to get noticed uh, at the top, I think, is... Uh, somewhat extraordinary given uh, essentially what's been happening to inequality in the United Kingdom uh, over the last 30 years. This is a graph uh, that shows the income share of the top 1% uh, since 1937. It started falling continuously during the, uh, what became known as the era of the Great Leveling. It peaked at the bottom uh, uh, around the mid-70s and then has been rising ever since and we're almost back to where we started, you know, 70, uh, 70 years ago. Roughly two-thirds of the 36 richest nations in the world have curves that are, that are rather similar to this. The most significant factor that's uh, behind this U-curve um, is what's been happening to the share of output going to wages in economies. In the United Kingdom, you can see from this graph that the wage share held pretty constant uh, through the 1950s and 60s at around 59-60%. It then jumped in the era that became known as the profit squeeze in the, mid the crisis of the mid-1970s. And then it's been in pretty well free fall ever since. And we've had roughly a 7 percentage point fall in the share of income going to wages uh, s since it started leveling off again at about uh, 1979. We've also have a very big rise since 1979 in the pay gap between the top and the bottom. Um, indeed, pay at the, at the top has been rising at about twice the rate as the middle group and about four times the rate of those amongst the bottom 10%. So what we've effectively had is the bottom half of the distribution has been getting uh, a double whammy in a, in a way. They've been getting a, a, a falling share of a diminishing uh, pool. And the main beneficiaries of the falling wage share have been those at the very top. The share of income at the top 1%, it grew particularly sharply uh, between 1978 and the mid-1970s, but it did continue, and it rose by a third of three percentage points, and exactly the same for the top 0.1%. It also grew very sharply. So you can see that the United Kingdom now uh, stands second in the global league table um, for the proportion of workers on low pay. In the mid-1970s, the figure was 12%. So it's more or less doubled in the last, uh, twen last 20 years. There's some interesting countries up there as well. Germany has a fifth of workers on low pay. The reason for that, basically, is that um, wages have been stagnant in Germany uh, since the millennium. And that's been a deliberate, um, a deliberate aspect of uh, German economic policy. There are lots of factors that have explained that can explain these trends. But the most critical factor has been the switch in economic thinking in the, in, in the 1970s. Basically, a number of uh, people started arguing that egalitarianism had gone far too far, uh, that it was leading to lack of incentives in the economy, and that what we needed was a stiff dose of inequality, higher earnings at the top, higher rewards at the top, in order to kickstart the economy, encourage uh, enterprise, and that would lead to a bigger cake from which everybody uh, would benefit. Now, this was an idea that very much uh, started um, with the new right, um, but came to be embraced pretty, pretty much across the political spectrum. So it was broadly accepted by uh, New Labour and, and the Democrats in the United States uh, as well. And so what we ended up with was essentially a new economic orthodoxy, and that orthodoxy was that you can have more equal societies or you can have more efficient societies, but you can't have both. You've got to choose. Essentially, what we've had over the last 30 years is an experiment, a mass economic experiment 
we should try to put uh, these ideas into practice. The key question then is we've had 30 years of this attempt to create more unequal capitalism, which was meant to grow the size of the cake and lead to much more efficient economies. So has it worked? Has this model of capitalism delivered faster growth, a bigger cake, and more uh, stability? Uh, well, the evidence from the post-war era uh, that, it, that it has not worked. Um, this is a graph that shows that the top, the top line is the profit share, and you can see this is essentially the obverse of the fall in the wage share that I showed earlier on. Obviously, the, 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 the share of going to profits has been rising. Now, the key to the economic orthodoxy was this rise in the wage share was meant to lead to an increase in the level of investment in the economy. So we've had rising profits but falling investment. So we've had this big gap, and it's this gap that I think I will go on to argue helps to account for the reason we're in this crisis at the moment. The first thing that hasn't worked is we haven't had the investment boom that we were meant to have. Uh, the second thing that's happened is that productivity has been falling. The level of productivity since 1980 has been running at about two-thirds the rate of the 1950s and 1960s. The other thing that's happened is that we've had much more turbulent economies. We had three recessions during uh, the, the egalitarian managed phase of capitalism in the 1950s, 60s, and you can see that they were relatively short-lived and relatively shallow. All the recessions since then have been much, much deeper and uh, more prolonged. Essentially, the effect of this great experiment uh, has been that we've had a rising gap, but we've also, we've also built much more fragile uh, economies. Why is it that, that the theory uh, hasn't worked? The theory ignores one of the fundamental rules about the way economies work. Um, and that is that the distribute what we, we, we might call the distribution question, how do we divide the fruits of the economy between wages and profits, um, has a very big impact on the way economies function. And if you get those uh, two key elements, wages and profits, two out of balance, then you set in train forces uh, that lead to uh, uh, serious economic problems. If you look at the last hundred years, we've had broadly three different um, periods in terms of this relationship between the rate of increase in wages and the rate of increase in productivity. In the 1950s and 1960s, um, uh, wages moved up more or less in line with productivity. So uh, the, 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 the fruits of extra growth were pretty well evenly shared between those groups. Then in the 1970s, wages grew much more quickly than um, productivity. And this was an era that became, came to be known as the, uh, as, the profits, uh, as the profit squeeze. And that was a contributory factor to the stagnation of the, of the 1970s and the crisis of the 1970s. And then two other periods, during the 1920s, uh, and uh, since, ni since, the 19, since 1980, we've had the opposite phenomenon. We've had wages falling increasingly behind productivity. Both of them have ended in recession. About 60%, effectively, of the American workforce are no or only slightly better off today than they were 30 years ago. And this is despite productivity rising very rapidly, something very similar uh, has been happening in the United Kingdom. Since the 1990s, we've had exactly the same experience in the UK as in the, U in the US. It just started a little bit later. Why is it um, that when you get this uh, gap, this growing gap between wages and productivity, you end up with economic implosion? Well, there are three uh, main uh, reasons. Uh, the first reason is that uh, you end up stifling demand uh, in the economy. When wages start falling be behind productivity, then basically there's not enough money in the economy to, to buy the output uh, that is being produced. So effectively, consumer societies start losing uh, the capacity to consume. The solution to that problem over the last sort of 20, 25 years has been to pump economies full of debt. And we know that personal debt in the United Kingdom rose from about 40% of GDP in the mid-1980s to 160 percent of GDP by 2007. That kind of situation is unsustainable. It cannot uh, continue. 
Uh, the second uh, reason why we get problems is because the obverse of the falling wage share, which is these growing surpluses at the top, so you have, you know, the corporate sector is accumulating these big surpluses. These, big, th these corporate surpluses tend to be used not for investment, have we shown, uh, as i shown earlier on, uh, but to engage in economic activity that is not particularly productive. The demand problem wouldn't be a problem if the increase going to the top group was spent on productive investment, building infrastructure, building new companies, uh, creating wealth, creating new products and so on. But that's not what has happened. An increasing share of this money has gone into essentially unproductive style investment, what I've called wealth diversion uh, rather than uh, wealth, uh, wealth creation. The third reason is, is to do with um, once, you, once you create these big surpluses at the top, you create these enormous power structures and it's very, very difficult uh, to um, essentially, it means the, those companies and systems that are meant to be regulated uh, tend to capture the, 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 the regulators, and it makes it very, very difficult for governments to take the action that are necessary to correct for these uh, problems. What are the key lessons of this analysis? Um, it is quite controversial, by the way, and not everybody agrees with it, but um, what are the key lessons? Well, I think you know, the first lesson is that essentially been, we've been running an econ economic model uh, that is... Uh, fundamentally wrong. It's fundamentally flawed. All the evidence is that growth is wage-led, not profit-led. That is, if you allow the wage share to fall, you'll, you will end up with lower growth, not uh, higher growth. Um, uh, the second lesson, I think, is that more equal societies uh, tend to be less uh, turbulent societies. And I've, I've been doing some econometric work on that for the United Kingdom that shows that greater equality does, t does tend to lead to less, uh, less turbulence. Um, essentially, if we allow a small group of the economy uh, to colonize the gains of growth, we end up with demand deflation, asset appreciation, and a squeeze on the productive se sector of the economy. Has this lesson been learned? In one sense, yes. Um, it's certainly the case that governments um, across the world are starting waking up to the problem of uh, inequality. Yet despite this lip service or this concern with, with inequality, um, what's been happening over the crisis? Now, this is a graph that shows the relationship with 1999 held constant. It's the, it's the index of what's happening to labor productivity uh, and real wages. Uh, across the whole of the rich world. Uh, the wage productivity gap actually fell in 2008 and 2009, largely because uh, profits fell quite sharply uh, then, um, and, uh, but wages carried on rising. But what's happening since 2008, of course, is, is that um, the, way th th the gap has started to widen. The gap is now wider than it was when we started. In the United States, where there actually has been some growth, in the last, uh, in 2010, 90, more than 90% of the growth went to the top 1%. Um, uh, it's more difficult to say what's been happening in the UK. The earliest the, the, the data we have is 2010-11, um, and that's not terribly good for measuring what's really happening at the top. But this is, this is a, 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 it's a slightly cheeky graph, really, because it's, it's really comparing how, how the top executives of the top 100 companies have been doing compared with uh, people on median wages. And you can see, again, that gap fell in 2008, 2009, uh, but it started, it's carried on widening since then. Uh, that's, I think, one indicator that certainly for one small group of that group at the top, uh, they continue to thrive through the crisis. I just want to end with, uh, with three quotes. The first one comes from Pre President Obama, uh, during a major economic uh, speech he made um, about 15 months ago when he said inequality is the defining issue of our time. And, of course, he did pick this theme up and it became a dominating theme during the presidential elections and also in his State of the Union address. Perhaps even more significantly, Christine Lagarde, head of the IMF, um, uh, made a speech at Davos in which he said, excessive inequality is corrosive to growth it is corrosive to society. Um, now, you wouldn't have had the IMF saying that 
two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven years ago. Uh, but I want to leave the final word with um, a guy called Albert Edwards. He works at Society General, and he, 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 he writes a regular report to his clients. And this is one he wrote recently. Um, Capitalism may not have it quite so easy in the next phase. Labour will fight back to take its proper normal share of the national cake, squeezing profits on a secular basis. This is effect effectively a warning uh, to um, his clients that uh, you're going to have to fight pretty hard if you're going to hang on to what you've got. I find it interesting that you don't mention either globalisation or technology at all. So do you think these are just simply excuses that are given for what is fundamentally a policy-driven phenomenon? Globalization and technical change have been the official explanations uh, for these trends. Uh, they're the explanations uh, made uh, by both the IMF and the OECD in, 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 uh, in their report. I don't know whether you've seen the OECD has produced two very detailed counts of inequality in the last three years um, uh, in, in which they attribute uh, the falling wage share largely, well, not so much to globalization, but more to technical change, by which they mean workers with skills have been able to do very much better than people, uh, workers without skills, and that's what's led to the widening gap. But I think, and I've been doing some work on this, that, that it probably only accounts for about a fifth of this trend. Um, and I think the OECD actually have got their figures wrong. And in, in various discussions I've had with the OECD, they now begin to recognize that they think they may have understated other factors. The first is what's happening to, to bargaining power of labor. Um, and effectively, the bargaining power of labor over the last 30 years has been more or less eliminated. The proportion of workers in rich countries who are members of unions has more than halved over the last, last 30 years. And we know there is, uh, that, that, that the unions have a significant uh, influence upon, upon wages. But the second, and probably just as important, has been what economists call financialization, i.e. the increasing dominance given uh, to finance in, in economies. <sighs> Nearly all the increase in the share of income going to the top 1% is, in is, is accounted for by finance. If you think it's globalization and technical change, it's very much more difficult to do anything about that. Um, than it is if you think it's down to <coughs> relative bargaining powers and financialization. Those two things you can do something about. When we talk about this, we often talk about the way in which the new right wins the argument, the rich win the argument. There's also a degree to which organized labor lost the argument and did things which contributed to its defeat. I'm just interested in your, your thoughts about that. The 70s was the peak of trade union power in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the United Kingdom and in the United States. And you know, to some extent, that power... Uh, w w was misused. But I think we've got to remember that this was a period of very, very high inflation, and high inflation had been triggered not by trade union muscle, a little bit by trade union muscle, but all the evidence now is very, very clear uh, that inflation had been triggered by things like the collapse of the international finance system, uh, like the oil price hike. And so the unions were effectively responding to a crisis. But of course, it, 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 it made things worse, so it wasn't healthy. But also, I think we've got to remember that this was an international crisis. I mean, the, 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 the you know, out-of-control unionism in the, in the 1970s wasn't unique, unique to the U UK. So, yes, it did contribute. Um, and, uh, you know, although I, you know, I'm very much in favor of rebalancing uh, power between capital and labor now, and I think that, you know, that has to happen. We need a new model. I mean, I think we need, we, we need you know, an approach that, 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 that embraces different sorts of responsibilities on both sides, on, on capital and on labor. Can I just ask you to join me in thanking Stuart Lansley?